So today we have five colleagues from the NEO who will share uh, their ideas and opinions on the current uh, war in Ukraine. And I'll just uh, 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 tell you their names and I'll introduce them uh, later on a bit more uh, uh, elaboratively. So we'll have Dr. Karol Berkov, who's a specialist on Ukrainian history. We have Professor Nancy Adler, who's a specialist on Russia. Uh, Annelise Bobeldijk, she's finishing uh, a PhD on uh, a topic related to Belarusian history. Uh, Professor Ur Unger, he uh, specializes in the Middle East. And Dr. Tam Nyo, who is specialized in Vietnam and the effects of the wars in Vietnam. So I'll, I'll, I'll introduce him a bit, bit more later on. Um, and other practicality, perhaps, as you have realized, this session is being recorded and hopefully will be available online soon. And you also have the opportunity to post questions to the panel. You can send them to our um, moderator, Anna van Maurik. You can put your questions in the chat and Anna will uh, select some of them uh, to post to the panel at the end of our session. So it's only a one hour session, but we will hopefully have some time to, uh, to talk about uh, questions that, uh, that you have. Um, yes, and you can, yeah, you can post your questions in Dutch or in English, whatever you uh, feel most comfortable with. So I think that's it from me for now. Let's go over to our presenters. I'd first like to invi invite uh, Dr. Karl Berghoff to share with us. Um, Karl is a senior researcher at the NIOD. He's a historian of Eastern Europe, especially the Ukraine and the Soviet Union and the Holocaust. He is co-director of ERI, the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure. So Karl, please go ahead. Okay, so um, I have just a couple of comments. Uh, first on Russia. Uh, last Saturday, the Novosti News Agency accidentally published a article uh, that was actually supposed to be published once the war had sort of been won. And, and there was a screen grab that uh, I'm going to quickly quote. Russia is restoring its unity, the tragedy of 1991, this terrible catastrophe of our history, its unnatural dislocation has been overcome. Yes, at great cost. It was actually an actual civil war, but we still have some brothers shooting at each other. Uh, they are in separate armies, Russians and Germans. But Ukraine as the anti-Russia will no longer exist. Russia is restoring its historical wholeness by gathering the whole Russian world, the Russian people together. Its totality, great Russians, Belarusians and little Russians. Had we not done this, if we had allowed this temporary division to take hold for centuries, we would not, would not only betray the memory of our ancestors, but actually would be damned by our descendants. So this is a text that uh, obviously should not have appeared then, but it accurately portrays the thinking, I believe, of Putin and his uh, allies. And where does this thinking come from? It's not simply a copy of things that Stalin did. Um, looking at, for instance, the Second World War, during that war, Stalin was pretty careful in not to antagonize Ukrainians too much, uh, not saying that the Russians were better than them or obviously needed to guide them. That came a little later after the war, but Putin obviously didn't realize this. Putin is also marked by a, a typical obsession with this whole victory in the war. There's a nice Russian word, word for it, Pabieda Biesia, sort of victory obsession. Uh, this is for him, for Putin, the main thing. Uh, he has apparently uh, the view that that is sort of the key identity of, of Russians. Now, um, and of course, this is now totally failing. A quick word on what happens in Ukraine today and how all this differs from what we had in the past. I've been uh, 
visiting Ukraine and studying it for three decades. And I distinctly recall, for instance, that in the mid 90s, you could see Boris Yeltsin on television saying something about budget cuts or in, something of that sort in Russia. And then the people with whom I was staying in Kiev would actually respond uh, by uh, with some kind of uh, uh, alarm how are we going to live and, and, and i i would say uh, well we're in ukraine that's russia uh, and so there was not a real distinct sense of being separate even speaking ukrainian was very uh, new and and surprising at the time now all of that has changed and uh, this whole war has actually uh, consolidated ukrainian identity in a way that nobody could have predicted of course, it had begun with the uh, more uh, recent annexations uh, in the east and of the Crimea, but um, it's stronger than ever before now, partly because there are, are already new uh, stories, myths even, uh, partly true, partly not true, that will be told for a long time. I, I just read an article in The Guardian about it, and I totally agree. You have the story of a president not uh, willing to leave. You have stories of civilians blocking soldiers or of soldiers refusing to surrender. These are stories that are very important for nation building. And a major component here is the Jewish uh, factor. Um, the president is Jewish. And before this whole began, this, this war, we had already a strong growing tendency among the Jews of Ukraine to become really members of the Ukrainian nation in the patriotic sense, feeling Ukrainian. And that's very, very new, but now it's really stronger than ever. And we're now reaching a stage when even they are saying we have to get rid of Russian influence, which is unprecedented in Ukrainian history that the Jews of Ukraine really want to get rid of Russians as a factor, as a cultural model or as a uh, heritage that is nice to talk about. So that is all down the drain, it seems to me. A final word about the historical memory and awareness of Ukraine in a country like Germany. It's interesting that for so many years in Germany, there was no interest in Ukraine at all. Um, even though, they, of course, they occupied it during the Second World War, uh, I wrote a book about it, but it, it never appeared in German. There are Ukrainian writers who have been talking about Ukraine for years to the German media, and always the questions are the same. Is it really a separate language? Um, you're welcome to write your stuff uh, in your mother language because we can easily translate from Russian. We do this all the time. So all of that seems to be changing, and it's a good thing. Uh, and I'm most struck by the rapidity, the speed by, by which all of this has been uh, done. And of course, that's not because people started thinking more about history, but because they thought about the recent events. I was incredibly moved by the scene in the German parliament where the German ambassador, uh, Ukrainian ambassador was applauded by everyone. It was just incredible. And just a week ago, nobody would ex would have expected this. So because we're all supposed to be brief, I think I will stop here. Thank you, Carol. I, uh, I unmuted myself again. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, reflections, Carol. I would like to uh, introduce now Professor Nancy Adler. Nancy is a senior researcher at NIOD and professor of memory, history, and transitional justice at University of Amsterdam. And her research focuses on transitional, transnational, transitional justice. <laughs> Can't be the same, but it's different. Transitional justice, the gulag, the legacy of com communism, oral history, and memory. So it's all there. Nancy, please go ahead. Thank you, Ismay. Well, for Russia watchers, there has been considerable writing on the wall regarding the repressive nature of the current regime. I've been studying and writing about this phenomenon for over 30 years, and I'd like to briefly take you through a timeline of the Putin regime's increasing management 
of history and the national narrative for political purposes, which started gaining momentum around 2005. Now, this is just a selection. Its relevance is, I think, self-explanatory. In that year, Putin argued on national television that, quote, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. He was not subtle about this stance and has restated it many times and in many forms. In 2008, in the officially approved school curriculum, teachers were instructed to address the period of Stalinist repressions, not by focusing on the millions of victims, but by focusing on, quote, what we built in the 1930s. In that same year, 2008, on the eve of an international conference on approaches to Stalinism, the St. Petersburg Memorial Office was raided by masked men armed with truncheons. They confiscated the hard drive. Memorial was established in 1987 under Gorbachev and under the honorary chairmanship of Andrei Sakharov to research and commemorate the victims of repression. It is Russia's most respected human rights organization and most authoritative research center on Stalinism. And I'll get back to that. Since 2012, the Russian government has been making extra efforts to strengthen its control over history. Putin began his third presidential term in what was officially pronounced the year of history in Russia. Top level meetings were convened to develop uniform policies on history making. They were to promote the recognition that Russia played a major role in saving the world from fascism and positively contributing to the social and economic development of a number of countries. All elements of Russian society, including state institutions, scholars, and history instructors should come together in preserving historical memory and strengthening patriotism. So in that very year, and now I'm talking about 2012, the notorious foreign agent law came into being, alleging that organizations that receive foreign donations support foreign interests. And this ushered in a crackdown on civil society that's been going on for the last 10 years. The narrative on the past did not have to omit information, just skew its perspective. Stalin's repression of Russians ran parallel, after all, to Russia's rapid industrialization, the eradication of illiteracy and other achievements of the Stalinist era. To reinforce this understanding, in 2014, a Russian memory law was adopted to the constitution. Formally, it criminalized the exoneration of Nazism, but actually it cast a wide net to penalize much broader expressions, including any discussion or criticism of the role of the Soviet Union during the Second World War, or any type of equivocation of Nazism with Stalinism. Since last year, this law has been enforced with fines and imprisonment. Now, as we know, that same year, 2014, saw the Russian annexation of Crimea and the only museum on a gulag site, Perm, set up in 1997 and run by Memorial was taken over by local authorities. At the same time, the Putin administration authorized the writing of a textbook whose narrative would present a unitary vision, essentially saying that we are citizens of a great country with a great past. Moving to 2016, that year saw the demotion of the head of the Russian State Archive for the publication of a document deflating the myth of the heroic defense of Moscow, and at the same time, 32,000 pages of documentation was confiscated from Memorial headquarters in Moscow. On the research front, Yuri Dmitriev of Memorial called attention to mass grave sites of the Stalinist era, notably in the Sondermorg forest near the Finnish border. Here an estimated 9,000 victims lay buried in communal pits. He was arrested, tried and sentenced to 15 years in a strict regime facility. Moving to August, 2019, on the 80th anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Russian government hailed this move as a feat of Soviet diplomacy, quote, the only strategically possible step that allowed the Soviet Union to prepare for imminent future war. 
And all of this was accompanied by social control and surveillance. In 2019, the Ministry of Education circulated a protocol to scholarly institutions circumscribing their contact with visiting foreigners. It recommended that a minimum of two Russian scholars be present at every meeting with foreigners. It was moving toward a reinstitution of practices that characterized the Soviet period, which I remember well as a researcher. And finally, to cement state control of history, at the end of December 2021, the Procuracy of the Russian Federation sued for the liquidation of the International Memorial Society, and days later, the liquidation of its human rights branch. Memorial had been in a tug of war with the state for years on how the story of the Stalinist past should be told and they drew the line from past violations to present violations. In the midst of waging an internationally condemned war, yesterday, the regime won its battle against Memorial. Rejecting their appeal, the Procurator declared that Memorial, originally tasked with pursuing the historical truth and honoring the memory of victims of political repression, now aimed to falsify history and transform public consciousness itself from one that remembers the victors to one that repents for the crimes of the Soviet past. And this is relevant to our understanding of the current Russian regime because it manifests an entrenched systemic repression complete with hostility to freedom of expression and the stifling of critique, which means censorship of media and dissident voices. The official fictionalized history aims at both sanitizing repression and persuading the public that out of patriotic necessity, the survival of the state then and now requires the suppression of individual and human rights. So in closing, here we are in a situation that seemed unimaginable to Russia watchers and the world 30 years ago when the Soviet Union collapsed. At that time, we witnessed the toppling of Soviet era statues of Stalinist henchmen. Today, Stalin himself is being rehabilitated in mass culture, books, statues, and the public's mind. The present and the future have become unpredictable. So too has the past. The fact that the past has been changing every day should have been a warning sign. Some of these trends have been identi identified and analyzed in a volume that came out last year that I co-edited, The Future of the Soviet Past. As to today's context, I would like to leave you with the thought that memory wars and attempts of political leaders to rewrite history are dangerous precursors. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And I think on the topic of memory, we will be moving on. Um, I'd like to invite Annelise Vogelbeck to, uh, to share her thoughts. Annelise is a PhD candidate at the NIOT and uh, the University of Amsterdam. And uh, her topic, the topic of her PhD is on the memories and narratives on the camp Mali Trostenets in Belarus. And as of today, if I'm correct, she's starting on a new project uh, at the University of Wageningen on hunger, we, and this project includes the famine in Ukraine uh, in, the, in the 1930s. So please, Annelise, go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Ismay. Um, thank you uh, for my colleagues, for their insights, and everyone for being here. Um, my contribution will be about the position of Belarus today and how this differs from 2014, and how the role of history um, was abused uh, or used in this position. Um, the position of Belarus has in particular been uh, rather important for Putin the last months, of course, in particular because of the possibilities that come with the uh, geographical location of Belarus in the context of uh, the Russian aim of occupying Kiev. I've been in Belarus several times for the research for my PhD dissertation about the history and memory of Mali Trosnets and Blakovshina. Um, these were nasty a Nazi forced labor camp and killing field nearby Minsk. And uh, this site is internationally important for the memory of the Holocaust because the victims were not only Jews from Belarus, uh, but also Jews from, Ger from what is today Germany, Austria, and Czech Republic. 
the recollection of this past is thus not only a national uh, of national importance, but also carries an international significance. It's not an, in, an internal affair for Belarus. I will return to this later, but first say something about uh, 2014. At the moment that Russia invaded and occupied Crimea in 2014, the situation for Belarus was rather different from what it is today. Although Belarusian President Lukashenko was at that moment 20 years in office already, his personal and also Belarus's position in the, uh, at the world stage was a lot more flexible than it is today. His domestic response was quite telling at the moment, as after the invasion of Crimea, he started speaking uh, Belarusian instead of Russian, which he did not do prior to this moment. Although it is the official language of Belarus, it's most often connected to the opposition, also historically seen. Um, he also started to underline that Belarus did not um, uh, equate, uh, was not equal to Russia and that it held an independent position in the world. This was also visible in the role uh, Belarus took on in September 2014 when hosting negotiations in Minsk between Poroshenko, the former uh, president of Ukraine, Macron, Merkel and Putin, which led to the Minsk agreement. Although at that time the regime was also named the last dictatorship of Europe, uh, so everyone was well aware uh, of the type of regime it was dealing with, the position of Belarus as not being really tied to Russia was interesting for many foreign powers. For example, since the late 2000s, uh, China has showed increased interest in Belarus. Today it, hold up, uh, it holds approximately 20% of its foreign debt and uh, Xi Jinping personally visited uh, Belarus in 2010 and 2015. Well, Lukashenko on his turn went even 12 times to China. This interest was also visible uh, while being in Belarus. In 2014, there were no uh, signs of Chinese businesses, uh, business activities in Minsk when you walked around. But in 2018, uh, the Minsk metro was completely uh, uh, filled with, also with signs also in Chinese. The countries um, bonded on uh, also ideological uh, IDs and called themselves the Iron Brotherhood. For Western Europe, Bar uh, Belarus was also in, uh, economically interesting terrain. As a Dutch business uh, man from a telecom company told me during a flight from Minsk to Warsaw, Belarus was still uncharted territory with many opportunities. Here, instead of the strongman talk from China of Iron Brotherhoods from Western Europe, history was called upon to strengthen ties with Belarus. Although this might sound cynical, the history of the Second World War and more specifically the memory of Mali Trostenets gave room for the strengthening of a bi and unilateral relations between Austria, Germany and Belarus. Within the four and a half years of my uh, PhD research on Mali Trostenets, three large monuments were unveiled in Minsk. One was built by Austria and the other two um, were for a large part funded by Germany and Austria together. Prime Minister of Austria Kurz, its president von der Bella, uh, and German President Steinmeier all visited Minsk in connection to the monuments for Blakovshina and Mali Trostenets. During the unveiling of the main monument for Blakovshina in June 2018, everyone involved from all countries underlined how Mali Trostenets is part of a joint European history. Lukashenko spoke that day that, and I quote, uh, today we see that the past does not stop at national borders, end of quote. Although I'm not questioning the intention of the individual persons of, um, in, for their involvement or engagement with this history uh, and its victims, it is clear that history and more specifically a joint history is used for economic and political influence in Belarus. A relative of an Austrian victim who was murdered in Blagovshina during the Second World War was invited for one of the commemorations uh, together with two other relatives of uh, murdered victims. She spoke to me of uh, how behind the minivan with them, the relatives in them, there were two large buses with trade missions who were joining them as well. However, for Lukashenko, being part of this particular narrative of a European joint history is, um, is rather difficult. During a commemoration in 2014 at Mali Trostenets, Lukashenko spoke about the relevance of the Great Patriotic War being questioned, and he... Um, um, he spoke about this, he said, and I quote, we must not forget it. We must not give this great victory away. It is a testimony of the greatness of the Soviet people whose descendants we are. End of quote. The history of the Great Patriotic War is one of the most important pillars for, the na for nation building in Belarus, like in Russia, because when you're not democratically chosen, you have to rely on other forms of uh, legitimation. 
However, despite historic ties or victories, the flirtations with various nations came to an end in, the two, in 2020 with the demonstrations over the presidential elections. Here, again, anal analogies to the history of the Great Patriotic War were used as well. The opposition or the demonstration, uh, uh, those involved in the demonstrations, spoke of uh, needing to crush the fascist vermin, while the authorities um, tried to link the protesters to Nazi collaborators because of their use of the red white flag, um, which uh, was used by Nazi collaborators, but is not com completely accurate because it has a longer history. Um, the brutal treatment of opposition members, journalists and civilians have turned Western powers uh, consequently away. Putin has acted on this by stepping in and offering Lukashenko all sorts of, uh, all sorts of certainties. This started already in 2019 through treaties that integrated Russia and Belarus further. While China at the same time tried to convince Belarus otherwise with enormous loans. From then on, Belarus further turned away from Europe during which was um, from this perspective where we now at uh, was ironically called a migration crisis in November and December last year. To finish uh, about the present day, the present day invasion in Ukraine shows the stronger influence of Putin rather well in Belarus. In Belarus, a high number of Russian troops were installed and on Sunday, the positioning of Russian nuclear weapons on Belarusian soil was made possible by the, I think we can all agree, uh, illegitimate illegitimate uh, referendum. Despite the brave efforts of groups of Belarusians who have tried to protest the war from within and outside of Belarus, the Belarusian people are in practically no position to oppose any of this. Uh, as people are arrested for the most insignificant things, independent journalism is practically made impossible and opposition is being exiled, arrested or even murdered. With the rumors, but I think Karol confirmed that these were not rumors, uh, that Putin had or has in mind to turn Russia, Belarus and Ukraine into something of a renewed Soviet, Soviet Union, Lukashenko's own wars are applicable again. Today we see that the past does not stop at national borders. The referendum ensured that Lukashenko will most likely remain the leader of Belarus for another 10 years and will most likely remain an ally and vessel uh, of Russia for the same period. Unfortunately, it also shows that the future also does not stop at national borders. Thank you. Thank you, Annalisa, for your sharings. And I move on quickly to our next speaker. That's uh, Ur Unger. Ur is senior researcher at NIOT and professor of Holocaust and genocide studies at the University of Amsterdam. His main areas of interest are the global history and sociology of genocide and mass violence, with a particular focus on the modern and contemporary Middle East. And I cannot see you yet, Ur, but I know you are there. I'm, I'm right here in the blue there shirt. You are. <laughs> Go ahead, Ur. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ismir. Um, uh, very nice that there's so much, uh, so much attention for this. Um, I would just like to show my... Uh, screen uh, share my screen so Anna can uh, can allow that uh, as you all or some of you might know that I'm interested in war and violence against civilians so uh, that um, means uh, that I'm interested in the violence that armies commit against civilians and I'm also interested in war sorry yeah. for interrupting you but can you just share your screen now so I can quit yeah. share this sure. sorry for this no worries here it thanks is. Does this work yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it just would be nice to have a little visuals. Um, so I'm interested in the violence against Lucy. I'm sorry. Okay, um, it's a bit of a risk, but let's try. Yeah, if there's a problem, just shut it down. No problem. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in the, the violence that ar that armies commit against uh, civilians, but also the violence that is committed against civilians uh, by groups that are outside of the regular security forces of a state, uh, such as the army or the police. Uh, and those irregular communities can be militias, they can be paramilitaries, uh, they can be intelligence agencies. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, the, in, the, the context in which I was interested or I am interested in this particular conflict, apart from uh, a fleeting interest, of course, in the history of Eastern Europe. Um, and and uh, in the past, so two decades, um, I have followed quite closely the uh, wars uh, that, the, that Putin and his regime 
uh, have waged in, in, in this region and, and, and abroad. So I'd like to just point very briefly at two topics. One is the context and the continuity of Putin's wars. And then second, uh, occupation violence against Ukrainian civilians or likely occupation violence. Um, so first of all, in, when, when Putin seized power, I was 18 years old. I'm now 41 years old and he's still in power. Um, and that means that in the past two decades, two plus decades, um, as somebody who's interested in the study of political violence, uh, I've followed uh, research, sometimes in depth, uh, some of the cases uh, of violence that uh, at least him or his government, his regime was involved in as uh, perpetrating. So first and foremost, it all started kind of with Chechnya. And this is, uh, so the second Chechen war, 1991, it lasted roughly a decade. Uh, this was uh, waged explicitly as a colonial war uh, in that combatants on the other side were, were not necessarily recognized as combatants, but as terrorists. Uh, so the uh, so 9-11, of course, brought a lot of political leaders across the world on the bandwagon of terrorism. So you could declare your uh, your uh, military opponent as terrorists, which means that, uh, which meant that you didn't have to defeat them to, after that to sit down in negotiations, but you have to annihilate them. And that's exactly what we saw in that war in Chechnya, a war of an extremely asymmetrical war of annihilation, um, the complete destruction of the city of Grozny, as you can see here in the this picture on the right top, uh, and also the assassination of the democratically elected president of Chechnya and Aslan Maskhadov. So that already was rather ominous and that didn't bode well for the coming two decades. Uh, but it only kind of got worse. Um, it, it, of course, we have the, the war in Georgia. What was interesting about that particular war, of course, it partitioned the sovereign state and there was an, an occupation in the north or a, to call an astroturfing uh, an occupation. Astroturf is what we call in Dutch Kunstgras. So that's artificial grass that they use when they play football. So astroturfing is a is a is a Putin Putinist strategy in which he makes it look as if there's a grassroots movement on the ground, so that then there's relative legitimacy or alleged legitimacy to that movement that he then moves into uh, to protect in quotation marks. And the two quote unquote independent republics now in eastern Ukraine are perfect examples of that. What is it? So that's one interesting thing. The second point about the war in Georgia was interesting is that Putin at some point he discovered the discourse of genocide. So he immediately accused the Georgian government of genocide of the South Ossetians and of ethnic minorities in Georgia. Um, like he did with Ukraine, right? So um, the idea that there was alleged genocide against Ukrainians or against Russians in Ukraine, for example, preposterous claims such as that. Then we move on and we have, of course, the uh, already, of course, and since 2014, the occupation war against Ukraine. The war didn't start now. It started then. This is eight, you know, eight years ago. Uh, and ordinary Ukrainians, soldiers, for example, uh, but also civilians have been dying already since then. I was once showed um, two years ago uh, a, a picture uh, of a Ukrainian historian uh, who's now outside of Ukraine showed me a picture of the uh, the, the military cemetery uh, in, in Ukraine. You see already thousands, many thousands of over 10,000, many more uh, soldiers who have died since this war. So it's a trickle that bleeds slowly. And so it, it doesn't start in February, 2022. That's very important to realize. Why? Because uh, for two reasons. One is we, we have a tendency of our attention to stop after the warfare. But after the warfare, for example, if there's an occupation, a lot of violence in civil against civilians begins exactly then. And so there was attention for, let's say, the occupation of Crimea. Then Russia occupied it, and we thought, okay, now there's quiet, quote unquote. And that's not the case. That's often when most of the violence begins. And we've seen uh, the violence against uh, Crimean Tatar activists, which is deeply re-traumatizing to these people who were, you know, integrally deported to Central Asia in 1944. And the violence that the Russian uh, government, especially the intelligence agencies, commit there against ordinary Crimean Tatars, uh, expropriation of their property, uh, uh, violence against cultural activism, violence against political activism, uh, and that's been going on now for eight years, and that's no joke. Um, then, of course, the war in Syria. And this is something that, let's say, by 2009, when I was interested in Chechnya, I didn't see coming. But in 2011, when the conflict in Syria began, or the regime began repressing its own population. Uh, that's when I really started getting into studying that society. And when Russia 
already from the beginning supported, of course, was propping up the murderous regime of Bashar al-Assad. Um, in 2015, then uh, intervened very directly. Huh? Um, so there was a direct bombing campaign that Russia conducted against, uh, allegedly against the kind of military targets, or again, the notion of terrorism. But what we've seen that bombing campaign is uh, three important topics. One is uh, the bombing of civilian infrastructure, of hospitals, for example. Go to YouTube, type in Russian bombing Syrian hospitals, and you see a fantastic report by New York Times open source materials in which you see that there's specific targeting of hospitals and of civilian infrastructure in order to make life under civilian rule uh, impossible. Number two, that Russian bombing campaign, Putin's personal bombing campaign, left 18,000 people dead. 18,000 people. And this, according to the most reliable statistics, is four, time, four times the complete uh, civilian uh, 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 death toll that ISIS has produced in the entire period that that, our, that, that organization was active. Right? So in a nutshell, Russia, only in the bombing campaign, killed four times more people than ISIS in its entire existence, give you a sense of perspective. And finally, the notion of refugee crisis, remember that, 2015-16? Why did that happen in 2015 and not in 2013, when a lot of the fighting in Syria was the worst? Because of the use of cluster bombings, or such as in this picture in the right bottom corner, this is Aleppo, cluster bombing, uh, thermobaric bombs, uh, basically testing their uh, military arsenal, uh, on, on, on Syrian society, and the refugee crisis re, um, emerged as a response to the Russian bombing campaign. There are one plus million Syrian refugees in Europe because of Vladimir Putin. Um, and, and I'm not even getting into the disinformation campaign, the, the MH17, uh, or the denial of uh, the use of chemical weapons, where they even sent two agents to The Hague to try to smuggle out the chemical uh, materials. So it goes on and on. Um, and now, of course, in 2022, February, we have the invasion of the rest of Ukraine. I'm not very surprised. Um, and I think we can expect, unfortunately, similar levels of violence against the rest of uh, romp Ukraine, as we saw uh, in Syria. Uh, and then finally, um, I don't want to be um, exceptionally negative, but I think it's important to be realistic. So from the perspective of somebody who studies violence against civilians, I mean, what would an occupation likely mean? Um, if we take Putin seriously, and I think we should, then there are a number of categories of individuals, of human beings that uh, would probably not be very safe. And that's first and foremost, of course, the nonviolent resistance against our occupation. Forget about the violent resistance, that's definitely, those people would most likely be summarily ex executed, but non nonviolent resistance. Uh, number two, uh, human rights activists. Number three, Ukrainian academics, in particular, Ukrainian historians. Yeah, because we often see during occupation that there's violence against the intellectual and political elites. Uh, number four, Russian dissidents who fled Russia came to Ukraine thinking they were safe. Uh, number five, the Chechen diaspora. So people who ran away from Chechnya in 2009 came to Ukraine thinking it was safe um, and only to be caught up by, uh, uh, by this particular occupation. And finally, or maybe not finally, the LGBTQ community uh, who is relatively rich uh, all over Ukraine. Uh, has their own NGOs and is relatively active, has, has their own local regional struggles. Uh, but that, of course, would also then be subject to the same treatment that they are in Russia, namely prohibition, uh, arrest, uh, deportation to, uh, to the Gulag, basically. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Uwe, for your sharings and also for highlighting occupation as part of the violence. Um, and I'd like to move on to our last speaker of today, that's Dr. Tam Nyo. And Tam is leading the program, the research program, Bones of Contention, Technologies of Identification and Politics of Reconciliation in Vietnam. She's leading that program at the NIOT. And she focuses on the role of religion and science in social healing, environmental reparation, and the politics of reconciliation in post-war contexts. And her focus mainly is on Vietnam and that region. So Tom, please share your perspective. Thank you, Ismay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today and to join us condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
in the next next few minutes, I wish to explain to you how the war in Ukraine is perhaps not yet a world war, but it should be one that concerns all of us. I will be speaking personally from a Vietnamese perspective and also professionally from, a, my, from my long-standing research on the impact and the consequence of the Chinese invasion of Vietnam in 1979. Taking cue from this historical event, I hope to illustrate yet another case of which history is weaponized by the Chinese perpetrator to aid the war agenda then, and also how history can be weaponized by the Vietnamese to defend the national sovereignty and independence. I was born in Lao Cai, a border with China. When I look across the Red River, I see advertisements in Chinese characters in Chinese town of Hu Ko. I would not have been here today speaking this word if in that misty cold morning of the, of the 17 February 1979, my mother would have been hit by the Chinese artillery shelling that destroyed her house in Lao Cai. Like all Vietnamese towns and villages along the Sino-Vietnamese border, Lao Cai was reduced to rubble in the 1979 China's invasion of Vietnam. The women and children of Lao Cai fled while all able men stay on to fight. Many were never reunited. In North Vietnam, people of my generation as known as baby who fled with the uh, baby who fled the Chinese with their mothers. I would like to share with you a uh, only one slide of how this uh, war resemble uh, the war and the image I'm seeing on television every day today. So uh, um, can I share uh, a very quick sharing of my screen? Um, yes, you can share. Okay. Sorry about that. Ah, can I see it here? Well, I cannot. Um, yep. So this is not. Uh, sorry, it somehow I, my my screen is not working. Hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine re resembles a number of ways the Chinese invasion of Vietnam in 1979. The Ukrainian was until recently the brothers of the Russians. They share history and a significant part of civilization with Russia. Similarly, the Chinese and the Vietnamese was brothers, communist allies against American aggressions. They also share a civilizational history the independent course that Vietnam was taking in Cambodia against the interests of the Chinese. So the latter that the former had to be taught a lesson about who was the boss in this past of the world. The invasion was relatively short, only 17 days, but part of North Vietnam was destroyed, tens of thousands died, and military border conflict continued for 10 years. The general distrust of Chinese action and, in and intentions have continued until today. It flare up against in the current South China Sea conflicts that involve China, Vietnam, and several South Asian nations. The Chinese pretext for their military intervention was to protect ethnic, ethnic Chinese citizens of Vietnam, while the Russian pretext is to protect ethnic Russians in Ukraine. The Chinese objective were also to warn the Vietnamese leadership that they could not be independent from China, the Russian want to affect regime change, a concept seemingly derived from the American intervention in the Middle East, and have declared that the only way for Ukrainians to avoid human misery is to stay in Russia's orbit. At the time, the Vietnam, uh, the Vietnam war machine was well oiled after many battles with the Americans. The Chinese faced a tough comp uh, opponents, despite the fact that the Vietnamese now have two fronts in Cambodia and in North Vietnam. Nevertheless, there was no doubt that Vietnam would not be able to win a military conflict with China, thus as much as Ukraine today cannot really win from Russia. 
What both Ukrainian and the Vietnamese will do is to resist, even when there is a regime change. The suffering for this striving for supremacy cost cannot be measured, but an important aspect is that people vote with their feet. Those who can leave, leave. The aftermath of the communist unification of Vietnam and of the wars with China and Cambodia was an unprecedented Indo-Chinese refugee crisis. Many of the lumpia sellers in that city today have fled from Vietnam then. Why these boat refugees mostly came from South Vietnam, a simultaneous flow of migrants come from North Vietnam to Eastern Europe during the communist period and continuing until today to the post-communist world. That is why one fire thriving Vietnamese communities in former East Germany, Poland, Hungary, and so on. In Ukraine, the estimated number of Vietnamese is 50,000. They have benefited from border trade in these areas, supplying large markets for cheap clothing and other products in Warsaw, Budapest, and East Berlin. Having left Vietnam for a better future, they have ended up in another war zones. Their informal trade and existence most, mostly stay under the radar. They are, however, symbol of grassroots interconnected, interconnectedness of a globalized post-socialist world. They might have been able to work and live in the informal interstice inter, inter of that one, but now are roughly reminded that the state and the military power still exist. For people living in Southeast Asia, the question is what kind of lesson China will draw from the Russian war in Ukraine? When, when Putin can just go ahead as usual without dire consequence inflicted by the West, China may interpret this as another sign of the decline of Western power and determinations. This would not be a good news for the people of Taiwan, but also more broadly for the people of South and Southeast Asia. While China is generally quite adamant to support the notion of national sovereignty and non-interference in another state affairs, it has been silenced until today. The only potential alliance for Russia may be with the Chinese who need gas, oil, and are building a, in a financial infrastructure that is independent from the West. The war in Ukraine is not a one war, but it is interpreted throughout the world with specific concerns that people in different places have. The, for Vietnamese, this war threatened the Vietnamese community in Ukraine and Eastern Europe, but perhaps more important to them is the impact that it might have on Chinese imperial pursuit. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for, for your sharing also of your uh, personal link and um, bringing in the people who are um, on the move, who are fleeing, who are fleeing their homes now. And um, we have a few more minutes left, so I would like to ask Anna if she could uh, share some of the questions that may have uh, come about in the chat. Thanks for this, Ismay, and thank you all for your wonderful questions. Uh, we received a lot of questions, um, so uh, unfortunately we cannot uh, answer all in this session. Um, but I want to start with a question to Nancy, and perhaps we can answer them briefly so we can answer more questions uh, in this time. Uh, for Nancy, I will unmute you. Um, does the specific repression of Ukraine by Stalin, such as the Holodomor, influence the debate regarding uh, the ongoing events? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, there are, in general, no specific events uh, that are being referred to in this. If I understand this well, uh, Stalin's repression of Ukrainians uh, that, that resulted in Holodomor, would that be, if, if that would be a particular goal here? Um, not specifically. I think that there, if we 
if we follow uh, the news that we have, there are numerous goals and certainly expansion of Russian and, uh, well, Soviet territory. Um, I think that some of the outcomes could be quite grim, as my colleague Orr discussed, if there is um, occupation of those territories, uh, that would be getting way ahead of ourselves. But I, there have not, there hasn't been any specific uh, rhetoric related to that. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Um, I've got a question for Carol. Hi, um, Carol, can you please um, tell us how the situation today may affect the project of the Bobby Yar Museum? Oh, I'm sorry. I think you can unmute yourself now. Hi. Yeah, that's, I of course followed that. I was involved with this project funded by wealthy businessmen with links to Russia. Um, the main donor is landed on the sanctions list of the European Union yesterday. Uh, meaning he cannot, I suppose, travel to Ukraine. Um, that already seems to boat that it would be very difficult to to have him involved in that project again. Um, although there is already a foundation which has the funds in a Ukrainian bank, so in that sense, it's no longer Russian money. It, uh, but the involvement of the person might be in question even more than before and um yeah well the bobby r center had it, a artistic director who is a russian citizen so I, i'm really questioning if that's going to be uh, uh possible uh, so far uh, i think ukrainians were rather generous uh, most of them in saying his nationality is not important it's it's the the structure in which he operates but i think the atmosphere is it's changing rapidly so that I, I would really be surprised if, if there would not be some fundamental changes. The chair of the supervisory board is Natan Sharansky, based in Israel, himself a former refusenik. He immediately put, a, put out a video condemning uh, uh, this attack and saying this center can only be created in an independent Ukraine. So that seemed to rule out continuing with the project if it if the territory including kiev would be occupied by russia so that that's certainly a strong statement but it's very much in flux very much in flux thanks carol um i've got an, another question here um and please let me know who i can unmute for this to what extent can the invasion of ukraine be seen as a long expected tactical move of putin and to what extent as an impulse to no one expected? In other words, is Putin an evil genius, uh, but still calculable, or has he become an unpredictable madman? Who wants to say something about that? And who can I unmute? Karo? I think you can unmute yourself now. Yeah, I, I, of course, like everybody else, is reading all kinds of articles, and uh, he, uh, he does seem to have ch been changed a lot, uh, maybe even because of his isolation, uh, living as a single, lonely individual without any much contact with other people. So I don't think there is a plan that he hatched already years ago. Um, his conviction that that these Ukrainians are uh, terribly uh, great nuisance that's that's not new, but I he never came out until uh, last year with this notion that they're actually not a real people, um, and that's a grave insult that he may have uh, cherished longer, but we didn't really know about it. So uh, we just don't know how much he changed. It does seem that he changed and became more confident. Uh, after the lack of response to the annexation of Crimea and the war in uh, Donbass. So, uh, 
And his notion of that there are people suffering from genocide, that it seems to be genuine. It's not only cynicism, it seems. He really fears for Russian speakers being sort of persecuted. And the other thing is he's probably a victim of his own propaganda. It's like Trump, you know, you tell the propagandists to say these things on television and you then you watch it yourself and you start to believe it yourself. It's sort of like a accelerating process. Thanks for this. Oh, Nancy, yes, you can amuse yourself. Thank you. Uh, um, I just want to uh, briefly point out that I, I think uh, some part of this is seeming, it's, a, it's coming across as much less rational uh, than we are trying, we are here as scholars trying to explain the behavior and I think some of it is quite hard to explain. Um, I, <laughs> many America watchers said the same thing about uh, Trump and his mental state. Uh, still he persevered and he made it all through a presidency. Um, so even if uh, we have concerns about the state that he's in doesn't mean he can't uh, continue to carry out this project uh, wherever it, it may be heading. Let's not forget, it's been brought up by many of the pre presenters today. There is very much of an image of um, victory as a patriotic religion. Uh, the Great Patriotic War, the Second World War, is, um, is the initial source of that, um, but looking to the bright past, has also become a very important uh, nation building identification uh, theme. So when the, when the bright future of communism did not arrive, the bright past became much more important. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Um, I've got a question for Tom. Um, how would a Russian victory entice China to react on Taiwan and other claimed areas considering her history of tribute states, would it include violence? Thank you. Well, I uh, could only say from um, what is emerging in, in, in Vietnam media in the last few days, but also uh, in the wider regional discussion, what is happening in Europe, what is happening in, between, uh, in, in, in Ukraine uh, is bringing back a lot of bad memories. We have seen in the past uh, Chinese in, uh, 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 launching attack on Taiwan and at that time the role of America was very important. What we need to hear, what, I mean what the Vietnamese uh, audience and Soviet Asian audience right now is looking at is how the West and also America is reacting. So um, if nothing is going to stop the Russians, uh, well, personally speaking, uh, um, not, not as a scholar, I can see uh, um, from the, the public in Asia is that the next violence will be uh, inflicted by China. And that is something uh, very scary um, uh, given the, the, uh, if, if the Chinese uh, is going to use the same uh, rhetoric as it have done in the past and also what is uh, Russia is now doing uh, is to protect um, Chinese population in South Asia then Taiwan's uh, Vietnam or any other South Asian nation that have Chinese population uh, that are involving in this very, very tense uh, uh, marine uh, conflict in the South China Sea has a full right to worries. I have to unmute myself. Thank you for this, Tom. Um, because of the time, we're already, uh, it's already past two. So I'm, I'm sorry, this was the last question. Uh, I'm sorry for all those people who asked questions, but we couldn't answer. Um, but thank you for them. Um, yes, may I now go over to you for the last, for the, for the final words. I think you can unmute yourself now. Yes, thank yeah. you, uh, Anna. <laughs> A lot of clicking going on. Thank you, uh, colleagues, dear participants, for, uh, for being with us today in our first session of uh, Neot Actuel on the war in Ukraine, history becomes weaponized. But I think we, as we pointed out also in the uh, session with the questions, it's not only 
located in Ukraine. There are many more things going on. It's, uh, it's beyond uh, one geographical uh, uh, location. Uh, I, I hope our reflections uh, were of help for you, of, you know, to make sense of the times we're living in. And um, we hope to uh, see you all soon in our next session of uh, NEOT Actuel for now. Thank you so much and uh, see you soon.